Hello and welcome. Today, we are going to tackle one of the most powerful, and let's face it, sometimes one of the most intimidating technologies out there, Kubernetes. We're going to pull back the curtain and show you exactly how this thing orchestrates, well, a huge chunk of the modern internet. So, have you ever stopped to wonder how these huge, massive apps, you know, like Netflix or Spotify, how do they never seem to go down? I mean, they're always pushing updates, things are constantly changing, but they are always on. Well, the secret sauce for a lot of them is a technology called Kubernetes. So, what's the problem that Kubernetes is here to solve? Okay, think about modern apps. They're not one giant piece of code anymore. They're actually broken up into all these tiny, independent microservices. And each of those little services runs in its own little isolated box called a container. Now, this is awesome for building stuff fast, but it creates absolute chaos when you're trying to manage hundreds or even thousands of these little boxes. Trying to manage that manually? Oh man, it's like trying to conduct an orchestra with a tangled mess of wires instead of a baton. It's just a recipe for disaster. So how does Kubernetes actually bring order to all this chaos? Well, it gives us a really simple set of building blocks. And the most fundamental one, the very first one you need to know, is called the pod. Now, the keyword here is abstraction. See, Kubernetes doesn't actually manage your containers directly. Instead, it wraps them up inside this logical thing called a pod. You can kind of think of a pod as a little home for your container. It gives it a place to live, its own network address, everything it needs. It is the smallest, most basic unit in the entire Kubernetes world. And where does this pod live? Well, it lives on a server. But in Kubernetes land, we don't call them servers, we call them nodes. A node could be a real physical machine in a data center, or it could be a virtual machine up in the cloud. It's just the worker bee, the machine that's doing all the heavy lifting of actually running our pods. But this right here creates our first big problem. Pods are what we call ephemeral, which is just a fancy way of saying they're temporary. They can be destroyed and replaced at any second. And when a new pod spins up to replace an old one, boom, it gets a completely new IP address. So how are other parts of your app supposed to find it and talk to it if its address is always changing? And that brings us to our next set of tools. These are all about creating stable, reliable connections, both inside our cluster and with the outside world. The solution to our changing IP address problem is an object called a service. A service is like a permanent frontman for a group of pods. It gives them a single, stable IP address and a predictable name, something like my database. So now, other parts of your app, they don't need to know about the individual pods that are always changing. They just talk to the stable service, and the service handles routing the traffic to a healthy pod behind the scenes. That's a perfect way to think about it. The pods in the background, they can come and go, they can move all over the place, but their public mailing address, the service, that never changes. This is what makes the whole system so much more stable and resilient. So let's trace the journey of a request, right? From a user all the way to our app. It starts with the user, of course. Then it hits something called an ingress, which points it to the correct internal service. And finally, that service zaps it over to a healthy pod. So what's that ingress thing? Well, think of it as the smart front door for your entire cluster. It's the traffic cop. It looks at the URL that's coming in, like myapp.com slash analytics, and it knows exactly which service to send that traffic to. This is what lets us use nice, friendly domain names instead of some ugly, clunky IP address to get to our apps. Okay, so now we can connect to our application, which is great. But how do we make sure it's always running? And what happens when it gets a ton of traffic? This is where Kubernetes really, really shines. Right, let's talk about the stuff that's going to happen eventually. Failure. A server is going to crash. A bug is going to take down a pod. Or maybe, just maybe, your app goes viral and the traffic just explodes. If you're relying on just one single pod for any part of your app, you're just asking for trouble. And this brings us to a super important concept. In practice, you almost never create pods by themselves. Instead, you create a deployment. A deployment is basically a blueprint where you declare your desired state. You just tell Kubernetes, hey, listen, I want three copies of this application running at all times. That's it. And the deployment's job is to be the manager that makes that happen. And this is the magic of that desired state idea. We told our deployment we want three copies of replicas. If one of those pods crashes, the deployment controller immediately sees the difference between what we want, three, and what's actually there, two, and it instantly spins up a new one to fix it. This is automatic self-healing, and it is the absolute key to high availability. Now, deployments are perfect for what we call stateless apps, like web servers, where every single copy is identical. 
you don't care which one answers your request. But what about something like a database that has a state, you know, the data itself? You can't just treat database replicas as interchangeable. For that, we use something different called a stateful set. It makes sure each pod gets a unique sticky name and identity like DB-0, DB-1, DB-2. And that stable identity is absolutely crucial for apps that need to keep track of their data. So we've seen the building blocks for our apps, but how does the cluster itself actually pull all this off? Let's zoom out for a second and look at the big picture architecture. At its core, a Kubernetes cluster is really just a team of computers all working together. And this team has two very different roles. You've got the master nodes, who are the managers, and then you have the worker nodes, who are the employees actually doing the work. The master node is the brain of the whole operation. It watches over everything, it decides where new pods should go, and it reacts when things break. The worker nodes, they're the muscle. They don't make any decisions, they just take orders from the master and do the actual grunt work of running our application pods. And inside that brain, there are a few key components running. The API server is the front door that we talk to with our commands. The scheduler is like a logistics expert, finding the best worker node for every new pod. The controller managers are the watchdogs, constantly checking if reality matches up with our desired state. And all of that information, that desired state, is stored in a super reliable database called etcd. That's the cluster's memory, its single source of truth. Okay, that was a lot of ground to cover. So let's just step back for a second and connect all these dots. What's the big idea here? The big idea is this. Kubernetes lets us manage the absolute chaos of modern apps by simply declaring how we want them to run. We just describe our perfect setup using these simple building blocks, pods, services, deployments. Then the cluster's brain, the master node, works tirelessly 24-7 to make reality match our declaration. It's this powerful system of self-healing, scaling, and resilience that turns a complex mess of servers into what feels like a single, powerful, and incredibly reliable computer. It's really not an exaggeration to say that this declarative, self-healing model is the engine that powers a huge part of the modern web. It's what makes massive scale and incredible reliability even possible. So now that you know the secret, what are you going to build with it? If you've been anywhere near the cloud-native world, you've definitely heard the name Kubernetes. But what is it, really? Today, we're going to pull back the curtain and break down why this one technology has totally changed the game for building and running software. But look, to really get why Kubernetes is such a big deal, we have to rewind a bit and understand the problem it was built to solve. What was so incredibly chaotic about managing modern applications in the first place? Well, it all starts with something we can call the microservice maze. And that's not just a catchy name. It describes a real tangled mess that came from a brand new way of building software, a mess that was crying out for a solution. So think about it like this. The old way was to build one giant monolithic application. Simple to deploy, maybe, but an absolute nightmare to update. The new way? We smash that monolith into hundreds, sometimes thousands, of tiny independent microservices. Each one lives in its own little box called a container. This is fantastic for developers, but for the people who have to actually run the thing, it's a complete explosion of complexity. Trying to manage all those moving parts by hand is, well, basically impossible. And right into this chaos steps our hero. Kubernetes. It's like the grand conductor for this massive, noisy orchestra of microservices, bringing order and an elegant solution to the whole mess. So what is it exactly? The official definition is an open source container orchestration framework. Okay, that's a mouthful. Let's focus on that keyword orchestration. It just means it automates, well, everything. Deploying your containers, scaling them up when traffic goes crazy, and managing their entire life cycle, all without you having to lift a finger for every little thing. And it makes three huge promises. First, high availability. Your app stays up, period. No more 3 a.m. pager alerts. Second, scalability. Get a sudden flood of users? No problem. Kubernetes just adds more firepower automatically. And third, disaster recovery. When things break, and they always break, it automatically detects it and heals itself. It's pretty amazing stuff. Okay, that all sounds great in theory, but how does it actually do all this? I think the best way to understand it is to build a simple app from the ground up using the core pieces of Kubernetes one by one as we need them. First things first, our app's code needs a home, a place to live and run. In the Kubernetes universe, that home is called a pod. It's the smallest, most fundamental building block of the whole system. Just think of it as a little house that holds our application container. We don't really interact with the container directly. We talk to the pod that it lives in. 
But here's our first little problem. Pods are what we call ephemeral, which is a fancy way of saying they're disposable. They can crash, they can be deleted, and that's okay. Kubernetes will just instantly spin up a new one to replace it. But here's the catch. That new pod gets a brand new, totally different network address. So how can other parts of our application find it if its address is constantly changing? The answer is a service. A service acts like a stable, permanent address that sits right in front of our constantly changing group of pods. Other applications just talk to the permanent service, and the service handles the messy business of finding a healthy, available pod to route the traffic to. It's a reliable entry point. Okay, problem solved. We have a stable address, but we still have another huge issue. A single pod is a single point of failure. If it goes down, our app is down, even if it's just for a moment. And what happens when traffic starts to ramp up? One little pod is not gonna cut it. And this is where the real magic of Kubernetes starts to shine, with something called a deployment. You see, in the real world, you almost never create a single pod by itself. Instead, you create a deployment. A deployment is a blueprint where you declare your desired state. You tell Kubernetes, hey, I want three identical copies or replicas of this pod running at all times. The deployment then becomes your tireless robot working 24 seven to make sure that's always true. A pod dies, it replaces it instantly. Need to scale up to 10 pods? You just change that one number and it handles the rest. So now our application is running, it's stable, and it's scalable inside its own little world. But it's still locked away from the outside. How do we open the doors and actually let users in from the internet? Now, we could use a special type of service to do this, but what you usually get is a clunky, hard to remember IP address with a random port number tacked on the end. It's fine for testing, I guess, but it's not the clean, professional URL we want for our users. We need a proper front door. And that front door is called an ingress. The best way to think about an ingress is like a smart traffic cop for your whole cluster. It manages all the access from the outside world and lets you route traffic based on the web address. So myapp.com slash analytics can go to one service, while myapp.com slash shopping goes to a completely different one. It gives you clean URLs, it load balances traffic, and it handles all that complicated security stuff. So we've seen all these incredible components working together to automate our application, but that begs the question, who or what is actually running this whole operation? Who is the wizard behind the curtain? Well, a Kubernetes cluster is made up of two types of machines. First, you have the master node. This is the brains of the outfit. It makes all the big decisions, like where to schedule new pods and how to respond when something fails. Then you have the worker nodes. This is the brawn, the factory floor where your application containers are actually running inside their pods. So how does the brain command the brawn? Let's follow a quick request. You send a command to the master node's API server. A component called the scheduler finds the best worker node for the job. It then tells an agent on that worker called the kublet to actually start your pod. All the while, the controller manager is watching everything, making sure reality matches what you asked for. And the entire configuration, the cluster's complete memory of how things should be, is stored in a database called etcd. That's the core loop that makes Kubernetes work. So when you put it all together, it becomes really clear that the future of application deployment is orchestrated. This technology doesn't just improve things a little bit, it fundamentally changes the entire game. And this really says it all. The insane complexity of managing thousands of containers running across all sorts of different infrastructure, physical hardware, virtual machines, different clouds, it suddenly becomes manageable. Kubernetes provides that consistent, unified layer on top of everything. So if you remember anything from this explainer, remember this. Kubernetes tames the chaos of microservices. It creates a robust, self-healing system for our applications. It completely abstracts away the underlying hardware so you don't have to care what it's running on. And because of all that power, it has rightfully become the de facto standard for running modern applications in the cloud. And that brings us to a final, really exciting question. By taking away so much of the complexity that used to hold us all back, Kubernetes has opened the door for a new generation of incredibly powerful, resilient, and scalable applications. The only question left is, what are we going to build next?